back of your prayer cards and uh, and do it now. Before I go any further, do it right now. And I say something while everybody's doing that? Yes. I got to witness to two young men today, separate. Let me invite you to take your Bible, and uh, we may need to turn down just a little bit. I think I'm pretty loud. Uh, uh, take your Bible and turn to uh, Revelation chapter 11, if you would. And uh, we're going to continue where we uh, stopped the last time. Now, when we come to Revelation chapter 11, let me just mention this at the very outset. We are at a very significant point in Revelation chapter 11 for a number of reasons. First of all... You're at the halfway point in the Revelation. In Revelation chapter 11, verses 14 through 17, we come uh, to the, the middle section, really, of, of Revelation. And uh, so since we're coming to the middle section, to the midpoint of Revelation, let's just take just a few minutes to back up and, uh, and review what we have uh, already looked at. Now, I'm not going to take much time to do this, but let me just give you a reminder of what we have already uh, been through very, very quickly. Now you remember uh, that John makes it clear that this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. In other words, it's going to be the unveiling, it's going to be the unfolding of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And uh, when you look at chapters 2 and 3, what you see, you have the Spirit of God speaking to seven distinct churches. They are real churches, literal churches, and the Spirit of God speaks through John to them. Now, when you come to the end of chapter 3, you find something very interesting. You find no more mention of church uh, all the way through to chapter 19 because the church has left the earth. The church has walked off the scenes. The church has been raptured. And so, uh, because the church has been raptured, they're not going to be here until the time for God to bring His saints back to the earth. And so, uh, when you come to Revelation chapter 4, what happens is we're ushered into heaven. The scene is not on earth, but the scene is in heaven. And when you look in heaven, you find 24 elders. 24 elders are representative of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the 24 is, a, is symbolic when it comes to, to the saints of God, to the church. And so when you come to Revelation chapter 5, you see the beginning of the seal judgments. Now, the seal judgments come... Six, and then there's a, a respite. There's an interlude between the sixth and the seventh. And uh, out of the sealed judgments, it's sort of like a telescope. When you get to the seventh, then you have the trumpet judgments. And then in the seventh trumpet judgments, you have the seven bowl judgments. And uh, what we're going to look at tonight is going to span through to chapter 20, just the, the, the portion that we're going to look at. But So God is in the process of judging the world. You'll find in, verse, in chapters 5 and 6 for wickedness, rebellion, and bringing all things to a fulfillment, fulfillment that he has already said that he's spoken. And then when you come to chapters 6 and 7, they're the seventh seal judgment. In the seventh seal judgment, the great tribulation. You have the great tribulation, you have the rise of the Antichrist, and you have all of those things that will break loose on the face of the earth. 
Now you remember the Antichrist and all the things that he will do. And then you'll have the wrath of God. And uh, you remember that uh, there will be massive death. But God is going to seal 144,000 Jews. That's exactly what he says. There's going to be 12,000 from each tribe. Because uh, he's going to make it sure that the gospel is still proclaimed in the tribulation. Will people come to him? There will be some saved out of the tribulation. Just as God has his saints in the Old Testament, he has his saints in the church era, he's going to have his saints in the tribulation period as well. Because nothing is going to stop his agenda or his plan. Now when you come to chapter 8, keep in mind that you have the breaking of the seventh seal. The seventh seal carries with it sobering judgment. Uh, and the judgments are going to be upon the earth. You remember uh, that there's going to be a uh, hailstorm. The sun's going to be uh, turned black. The moon to blood. And so many other things that are going to be judgments upon the earth. And then when you come to chapter 9, you remember that chapter 9 reveals those sinister demons that are released from the bottomless pit. And the only reason they're released from the bottomless pit is so they can inflict injury and pain upon mankind for a period of time. Now you remember that at first they inflict pain, but then secondly, they take the lives of, of, of many. They're allowed to take the lives and they're allowed to kill. And when you look in uh, Revelation 9, 13, you find that there are going to be 200 million uh, demonic hosts that are released, that are bound in the Euphrates uh, River. Now, sometimes we look and say, now, Pastor, is all this going to be so? And I want you to listen to me very carefully. It is absolutely going to be a literal reality. And here's why. If you symbolize everything, who has the key to the symbols? What person has the key? No person has the key to the symbols. And one of the things that God is doing, He is using, He does use sim symbolic language, but it stands for those things that are concrete. You remember I told you back some time ago that your wedding ring is a symbol, but it's also something very real. Symbol doesn't mean something that's not real. It carries with it tremendous weight. And so when we get to Revelation 10, it reveals the most wonderful reality. And here's the reality. The reality that there's a great announcement that there is going to be triumph on the earth. Now, with everything that's happening, with the judgments, with the Antichrist, with all that uh, Satan does on the earth, some will say, well, there's no way for there to be victory on the earth. Well, Revelation 10 makes it very clear that there is going to be triumph on the earth. And so uh, when you, we're in the seventh trumpet at chapter 10. And uh, when you look at it, just mention a few things. Uh, it's a period that covers uh, a period of time. As a matter of fact, when you look at the seventh trumpet, it really covers on to chapter 20. Now, after we get through Revelation chapter 11, we're going to go back and we're going to relook at the tribulation in chapter 12, 13, and 14. You say, why are we going to relook at the tribulation in chapter 12, 13, and 14? Because up to this point, we've looked at it from God's dimension. But in Revelation chapter 12, 13, and 14, you're going to look at the tribulation from Satan's dimension, from the Antichrist dimension. And so that's what we're going to do when we move into those chapters. Now you remember in chapter 11 that uh, God gives a rise to two great witnesses. Those two great witnesses, they are brought by God to this earth. And you know some have suggested that one is Elijah, one is uh, Moses. I shared with you last week what uh, some of the greatest thought is. And some have thought, well, one may be Enoch. I heard one, uh, Dr. J. Vernon McGee said, he thinks one is John the Baptist. Well, the Bible doesn't say who they are, but the Bible does say in Malachi, before the end, Elijah will come. So my personal conviction is that Elijah literally will come back to the earth because Elijah, as you know, never died. He was caught up into a chariot of fire. And then there's another problem you have to face. The Bible says it is appointed unto man once to die. That's why some people hold that it's any. So... Uh, uh, in that three and a half period of time, right before the end of the Great Tribulation, the Bible says there's not going to be a bit of rain. Uh, these uh, prophets, these witnesses are going to withhold the rain. Now, folks, these are literal times. This is going to happen on this earth someday. Now, it could be ten years from now. 
Could be 20 years from now, could be 100 years, but it is actually going to happen on this earth. And so when we get to uh, uh, the portion that we're going to look at tonight, verses 14 through 17, we really look at the, at the launching of the seventh trumpet. Now I want you to look at uh, verses uh, 14 through 17 of uh, Revelation chapter 11. The second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ. And He shall reign forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders, which sat before God on their seats, fell upon their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and was and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. Now, you remember the two witnesses have been taken off the scenes. They have been taken back to heaven. They have been killed. They've been left in the city streets of Jerusalem. That is actually going to happen for three and a half days. They are left dead on the city streets. And then the Spirit of God moves into their being and they raise to life again. They're resurrected. Shortly after that, the Bible says that they're going to be taken in the presence of their enemies. In other words, the whole world is going to witness the ascension of these two great witnesses that God is going to use. Is it actually going to happen in Jerusalem? Yes, it is. is it, are they going to actually be killed? Yes, they are. Are they actually going to die? Yes, they are. Are they actually going to be resurrected? Yes, they are. And here's why. The Greek wording, when you study the Greek wording, what, you, what is being said there about the death and the burial, or the death and the resurrection, is very similar to, to phrases that's used other places talking about death. Uh, people who really died, people who had resurrection. So uh, the reality is these two witnesses are brought back by God. They're going to be killed. They're going to be resurrected. And they're going to be seen by the masses. Maybe television will, will absolutely just, if, if television survives the great tribulation, you just don't know all that's going to take place. Because remember, the whole world is going to be knocked out of joint. Meteors are going to come to the earth, and so that's going to affect television. That's going to affect, uh, you know, probably a lot of the uh, satellites. And so when you come to uh, chapter 11, verses 14 through 17, really this is one of the most significant and really one of the most exciting because it really gives you an announcement of the coming kingdom of God to this earth. Well, look in your outline and just follow along with me. The Bible says the second woe is past. Now, to understand this one statement, here's what you have to do. You have to go back to Revelation 8.13. And the Bible reveals that there is an eagle flying in mid-heaven saying, Woe, woe, woe. In other words, it's not just accidentally saying, Woe, woe, woe. You know, we say a lot of accidental words. You know, somebody says, What do you mean by that? Oh, I was just talking to hear myself talk. Well, can I tell you this? God never talks just to hear himself talk. Angels do not talk just to hear themselves talk. Absolutely everything God says, absolutely every word the angels say has significance, meaning. And so whenever you look at these, these woes represent trumpets five, trumpet six, and trumpet seven when it comes to the, the judgment. The first woe took place back in chapter nine. Uh, this woe was the releasing of the demonic hordes, you remember. The second woe was the sixth trumpet, and uh, that revealed more demonic uh, hordes and that were bring agony and death upon mankind. You remember we've already been there. And since we're at the end of the second woe, the Bible says the third one is going to come and it's going to come quickly. Now, when you come to Revelation chapter 11, verse 14, we come to the seventh seal, or the seventh trumpet rather, and, and we're looking at the end of the great tribulation. I want you to be mindful of what is happening. We're almost at the end of the world as we understand the history of the world. Don't you ever let ever anybody lead you to believe that this world is going to go on and on and on and on and on. There is coming an end of the world. How do you know that? Because it is written all throughout Old Testament. It's penned and 
prophetic uh, literature, and so it's all throughout Scripture. And so we come to verse 15, and the Bible records the seventh angel sounding. And uh, by the way, when the seventh uh, trumpet sounded, you know, it, we need to understand that this is not the same thing as in 1 Corinthians. You remember in 1 Corinthians, Paul makes it very clear that the trumpet of God shall sound. This is not the same as that. This is years after, because you remember Paul says, The trumpet of God shall sound, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive shall be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. So that is the rapture. 1 Corinthians 15 is referring to the rapture, is referring to the taking up of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so uh, the reference in 1 Corinthians 15, as I said, to the rapture. And so in this one is the trumpet judgments. Now, let me just explain a little bit to you, out of Old Testament literature, what is significant about trumpets. Matter of fact, we still use trumpets today in some form. We just may not realize what they're for. If you go back, you don't have to do it. You can mark it down or, or underline it and go back later. But if you go back to 2 Samuel chapter 15, you will find that there is a trumpet that is sounded when Absalom is crowned the king. In other words, the trumpets are used as coronation. There is the sounding of the trumpet in, first, uh, in 2 Samuel chapter 15, 10. And in 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 39, there is a trumpet that is sounded at the sound of the anointing of Solomon as the king. Do you get the picture? Now, I want you to, I want you to get the picture. I want you to listen very carefully. Are you, are you tuned in? Trumpets have tremendous significance in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Number one, they signify judgment. But number two, they signify coronation. Folks, what is getting ready to happen, the seventh trumpet is getting ready to sound, and what the world has been longing for, at least the redeemed world, is getting ready to take place. The Bible makes it very clear. There is coming a time when the kingdom of the world will become the kingdom of Christ. And I'll explain that. A little clearer in just a moment. But when you look between each sixth and each seventh, uh, there is a, a rest, there is an interlude. Why is it? Because, because these are so severe and so grave judgments, whether it's the seal judgments, the trumpet judgments, the bowl judgments, God gives a rest. He sort of gives a, a pause for the saints of God. And he says, hold on. I've got you covered. Don't give up your heart. Don't give up your hope. Because I know what I'm doing. Now, it's important to understand, before I go one step further, the whole purpose of the revelation. Do you understand the whole purpose of revelation as it is been? The answer is found in Revelation 1.8. I want you to turn back to uh, chapter 1. And in uh, verse 8, Jesus is saying, I am the Alpha, I am the Omega, I am the beginning, I am the ending. And when you look over in the first part, John says this is the revelation of Jesus Christ or the revealing or the unveiling. And the word unveiling and revealing carries with it the idea of seeing clearly. What is the world coming to? Well, I want you just to follow along because we're going to be looking at what is getting ready to happen in this world. Now, let me again remind you, in chapters 12, 13, and 14, we're going to go back and look at the tribulation the great tribulation from Satan's vantage point. Because he's going to show his dirt and it's going to be horrible. It's going to be, it's going to be horrendous. But here in uh, chapter 11, verse uh, 14 and 15, there is something that takes place in heaven and uh, there is something that takes place because something is getting ready to happen. Now, he said the second woe is past. Behold, the third woe comes quickly. But watch what happened. The seventh angel sounded... And there was great voices in heaven saying the kingdom of this world has become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ 
and he shall reign forever and ever. Now, what in the world does that verse mean? What in the world is John saying? What in the world is God talking about? The kingdoms of the world have become the kingdom of, the Christ, of his Christ. Well, let me explain something. The word kingdoms, if you look it up in the original language, it's not really plural, it's singular. And uh, whenever you look at the world, you know, you think about it. If you just look on a map or look on TV, we're a world of different languages. We're a world of different dialects, nations, tongues, all of that. But really, if you stop and think about it, the world is under the control right now of one monarch and what's his name? You know his name? Satan. Satan. Isn't the world under the control of Satan? Now, some of you is thinking about some human being. No, the world's not under control of one human being. That's going to come in the Antichrist. But the world is really under the control of Satan. Would you not agree? We may be Americans. Others may be Chinese. Others may be Ethiopian. Others may be African. Others may be different languages. But really, the world is under the control right now of God's arch enemy, Satan. But one day, in the timing of God, I want you to get this. The world order is going to change, and it's going to change completely. It's going to change absolutely, and it's going to change eternally. There is going to be a time when the world order will no longer be under the rule of Satan, of his demons, and of his cohorts. The Bible says there is going to come a day when the kingdom of the world are going to be handed over to the Lord Jesus Christ and He is going to rule and He is going to reign. Now you say, now that won't be until heaven comes. No. The Bible makes it very clear that Jesus is going to rule and reign on the earth. It's very clear. I want you just to follow along in your outline because it's all throughout the Old Testament and I've given you some passages to look at. Psalms uh, chapter 2 speaks of the coming of Christ and how the nations will be brought under His rule. And you can go back to Psalms 2 and look at that. But in 1 Corinthians 15, 24, 2,000 years ago, Paul mentioned it. He said, then comes the end. Paul's even talking about the end coming. Then comes the end. What's going to happen, Paul? When he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule, all authority, and all power. And so, Paul points to the very fact that the coming kingdom of Christ has been announced. And it's announced in Paul's letters. You go back to Daniel chapter 2 verse 44. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom. Get this. The God of heaven set up a kingdom. Now, somebody will say, well, has that already been? Let me ask you a question. Has there been a godly kingdom set up on the earth yet? Have you read about it in history? Has it happened yet? You say, well, Jesus was on the earth. No, the Bible says Jesus came to his own and his own received him not. So it's not happened. As a matter of fact, you can find it very clear because in that, watch what it says. Uh, God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to another people, but it shall break in pieces, consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. In other words, Daniel, thousands of years ago, he told about the coming kingdom of Christ on this earth. He told what it was going to be and what it was going to look like. Daniel 7, 13. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. A picture of the coming Christ as he comes back to this earth to rule and to reign. Now, some have said, well, why would he want to rule and reign on the earth. Well, think about it for a moment. There's a lot of just real simple, basic reasons. Number one, he created this world and he has the right to rule. Number two, he's never ruled on this earth. Well, you say, well, 2,000 years ago he came and he ruled on the earth. No, he didn't. There's no indication that says he ruled or he reigned on the earth. And so it's so important that you understand that this kingdom is actually going to come. And uh, Daniel 7, 18. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom, possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. 
In other words, Daniel doesn't just say it's going to be forever, but it's going to be forever and ever. And in a sense, you can just say keep on forever and ever and ever. So, and, uh, so God makes it very clear. Isaiah says, Behold, the Lord cometh from far, burning with his anger. Now, by the way, he's going to come, he's going to rule, but you need to understand that two things are going to happen whenever he comes. He is going to bring judgment. He is going to bring destruction to those who don't know him. Isaiah 30, 27, Behold, the name of the Lord cometh from far, burning with his anger. And the burden thereof is heavy. His lips are full of indignation. His tongue has a devouring fire. Now, folks, this gives you a little different picture of sentimental Jesus, don't it? Can I tell you, we have gotten such a washed down, watered down, soaked down image of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that we really don't fear Him. We have got a washed down, watered down idea. And we even go so far as like, well, He's the man upstairs. Don't you blaspheme the name of God by calling Him the man upstairs. Can I tell you that that is a blasphemous name because you're referring to him no more than a human being. It really is a degradation to his nature, to his character, and to his ways. And he is not the man upstairs. He is sovereign. He is holy. He is high and lifted up. Now you say, Pastor, is it really uh, antagonistic to do that? Yes, it is. Because he is not a man. Scripture makes it very clear. Now, Jesus came in a human body. He came in human flesh. And He had two natures running concurrent in His body. He was, he was God and He was man. But He is not the man upstairs. So, if you hear people say that, be conscious that He is not the man upstairs. If you say it, be mindful and allow yourself to stop because... That's not who God is. The Bible says that His lips are full of indignation. His, his tongue as a devouring fire. And so Isaiah gives a sobering reminder that the Lord is going to come. He's going to do some devouring. As a matter of fact, look down in verse 18 of chapter 11. And, uh, and the nations were angry and thy wrath is come. In other words, it's... There's going to be a time of wrath. There's going to be a time of judging. He's going to judge the wicked. He's going to reward. And so, uh, and by the way, even in the very announcement of Jesus' birth, do you realize that the very prophetic announcement of Jesus' birth, the Bible says that He's going to rule on the earth. Look, uh, and I think you've got it in your outline, chapter 1, verse 32, and I underline the bold part. Uh, he shall be great, referring to Jesus, and He shall be called the Son of the Highest. And watch what happens. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of David. Now, most of the time, all, most of my life, I thought about that as a heavenly throne. But you got a big problem. There's not one thing in the Bible that says David has a heavenly throne. There's no reference at all. As a matter of fact, those that... Uh, Judge the twelve tribes of Israel are the apostles. And, uh, and, and so the Bible makes it very clear. And so what's significant about this reference is that uh, the fulfillment has not yet happened, yet the wording is that it's already come. In other words, here's what God said. It may not have reached its fulfillment, but it's already a done deal in the heart of God. Jesus Christ has already in the mind of God, in the heart of God, He's already ruling from Jerusalem. And folks, I, I wish I could get it. It's going to be a literal throne. It's going to be a physical throne. It's going to be a visible throne. You're going to see Jesus Christ. Now somebody said, well now there's no way we can see God. The Bible says God is spirit. Yes, God the Father is spirit. And I've said this, this, this different times. Uh, no, you will not get to see God. Yes, you will get to see God. Now... Some of you say, now wait just a minute. You've got me so confused. No, you will not get to see God. Yes, you will get to see God. Understand. Anita? God the Son. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. God the Father is Spirit. There is, and He does, has never existed in a bodily form. God the Son, who is Jesus Christ, 
The Bible says this same Jesus, you son go up, shall so come in like manner. So Jesus has been in bodily form for 2,000 years. You say, now wait just a minute. When he went back to heaven, didn't he lose his body? No. This same Jesus that you see go up into heaven. So 2,000 years, Jesus has sat at the right hand of the Father. If you could be in heaven right now, what would you see? Would you see a, an invisible Jesus or a visible Jesus with a real body? You would see one with an absolutely glorified, awesome, wonderful body. As a matter of fact, when you look at the Mount of Transfiguration, that gives you just an idea. And so, uh, you know, the Bible makes it very clear. And, uh, you know, we have prayed, you think about it, the prophets repeat in the Old Testament about uh, the coming of the Lord and about the coming of the Messiah and about the ruling. Have you ever stopped to think about that it's the purpose, desire of God that, you know, that His Son ruled the earth? When you pray the Lord's Prayer, do you realize you prayed for Jesus to come and rule on the earth many times, whether you realize it or not? Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come. We say, well, now, that really is for your spiritual body, correct? Well, yes, that's one way you can. But isn't there something inside of you? Now, think about this for just a moment. Wouldn't you love, since we just had an election yesterday, and I'm sure everybody won their votes, wouldn't you love to have an election where absolutely there was no one who wanted to do wrong? Every elected official wanted to do the right thing. He wanted to be as honest as the day is long. He wanted to use money absolutely fairly and use it for the right purpose and in the right ways. And the meetings behind closed doors were how to better help people, how to make the world and the earth a better world. That is what is in our hearts as believers, is it not? Don't we get uh, antagonistic and aggravated when we find out so-and-so has embezzled $14 million of taxpayer money? And, uh, and we have come to... But you know what? The Bible makes it very clear. He's going to come and He's going to rule. Now, we say it so much and we hear it so much that we say, well, what does it mean rule on the earth? Do you realize the disciples were so blinded? Whenever Jesus uh, spoke to them about rising from the dead, they asked the question, what's He talking about rising from the dead? They thought there was some symbolism attached to it. Do you realize that the, the, the reference to ruling is not symbolic. The Bible says that there is coming a time. And that's why Satan is going to do all of his dirt. He's going to do everything he can. He's going to marshal all of his forces against the armies of God. Because he knows that the kingdoms of this world are going to be ripped away from him. And God is going to rule. You know, Isaiah says it best. He you remember the Bible says, the lion will lay down with the lamb. The child will play on the hole of the ass. And there will be instruments of war no more. Why? Because it's going to literally be a millennium of peace. And Christ is going to reign forever and forever. And uh, whenever you look at the text, notice uh, what it says. You know, it says... Uh, that uh, the kingdoms of this world. In other words, the seven angels sounded and there was great voices in heaven. What's happening? The, uh, the church, the angels, they're, they're shouting a glorious praise. Why? Because Satan is not going to win. Sometimes in your Christian walk, in your Christian faith, don't you say, uh, well, seems like evil won again. Sometimes I hear somebody say this, well, no good deed goes unpunished. Have you ever said that? Don't it show you the little bit of where the hearts of mankind... Because there's a sort of desperation. There's a sense of despair. There's a sense of despair among Christians. Well, I don't know. Maybe he'll come. Maybe he won't come. Can I tell you this? The Word of God is... I, and I, I don't have time to get into it. But the Word of, so, of God is so precise that it means exactly what it says. And, and it is right in line. Remember... That the Bible prophesied that Jesus Christ was going to be born where? Just in where? Bethlehem. You remember the Bible says in Micah chapter 5 verse 2? 
that uh, Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be the smallest, out of thee shall be a governor. Well, what is that? That's prophecy. Well, what is this? This is prophetic reality saying there is a time coming on the agenda of God when the world is going to come to an end as you and I know it. And we're going to be able to say our Lord reigns in Zion. That's what the reference is in the song. But what it literally means, the Lord is on His throne in Jerusalem. And uh, so, you know, and the time has come, as I mentioned, that uh, He's going to reign. And the Bible says He's going to reign forever and forever. Now, it gives you a different picture, does it not, of the end time? Because for a long time, I have always thought in the end time that everybody just goes to heaven. But can I tell you this? And this is why I get so excited. The picture of the end is getting clearer and clearer and clearer and clearer. Now let me ask you a question. Don't you think that as God gets ready to bring this world to an end, that He's going to give those last generations, those last, uh, that last generation that's going to be, He's going to give them a clearer picture of what's getting ready to happen. Sure He is. He's telling them what he, what's going to take place. Now I don't know if we're... The terminal generation. I would not be surprised if we are. Because there's just so many things that are in motion. Uh, I can understand from, the, from Scripture why the 1800s could not have been. Because everybody cannot see what's going to go on in Jerusalem. And the Bible prophesies that every eye shall be holy. But do you realize now that we have every means in place for those things to take place? And so... Uh, the Bible says in heaven there's great praise for the sovereignty of, of God's complete plan to, to rule the world. And, and you remember, Satan's not going to give up without a fight. Uh, as a matter of fact, nations will come together and there will be one tremendous ultimate war. And we're going to talk about that war on down the road. There's going to be the war of Armageddon. And uh, one tremendous cataclysmic war. And then God is going to bring His rule and His reign. Imagine living in a world, imagine living on an earth where there is no hunger. Imagine living on an earth where there is a utopia, where nobody's starving to death. You know, where there's no thirst, there's no homelessness. Well, can I tell you that that time is coming? It is actually, literally, really going to come. Now, I'm using phrases like actually, literally, because we need to... Be reminded, everything God says is going to take place, is going to happen. And uh, as I mentioned, you remember Jesus said uh, through, his, uh, through His messengers, through His angels, in Acts chapter 1, 11, which also said, You men of Galilee, why stand you gazing into heaven? Now, I want you to listen carefully to what it says. This same Jesus. Now, what are you going to look like in 2,000 years? You say, you give me three years and I look horrible. But understand, this is the ancient of days. That's why the angels, prophet, why the angels proclaim, this same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen Him go up into heaven. In other words... There is time coming that Christ is going to reign. Now, the Bible talks about a millennial reign. In other words, where Satan is bound, and we'll get into that a little bit later, and Christ rules for a thousand years. What I mean is, He is the governor of the world. He is the governor of the earth. It is His decrees that are ordered. It is His decrees that it is His edicts. Just like we have Congress, and we have legislatures, and we have presidents, and we have emperors, and we have world rulers, and we have kings. And, uh, you know, you have uh, sultans, and you have all sorts in the Middle East. The Bible says there is coming a time when all of the world will be under the rule of Jesus Christ. And the Bible makes it very clear that it's going to come. And, uh, and, and let me say this. You say, well, what about the Great Tribulation? I can tell you there's a lot of different thoughts. But understand, this world is still in motion in the Great Tribulation. Corbin, Kentucky probably is going to still be in existence in the Great Tribulation. Williamsburg, Kentucky is going to be in existence in the Great Tribulation. London and all those. 
Now, I don't know what they're going to look like, but they're still going to be in existence. In other words, if the rapture takes place today, there is going to be the immediate rise of the Antichrist, according to what Scripture says. He is going to rise to world power in a short period of time. For three and a half years, he's going to enter into a contract, into a covenant with the nation of Israel. In that three and a half years, at the middle of that, he is going to break that covenant. God's messengers are going to come and they're going to pronounce uh, God's judgment. And there is going to be great, great tribulation. Tribulation means the world is, is getting ready to shake. The earth is getting ready to shake. The seas are getting ready to shake. The bodies in the heaven are getting ready to shake. The sun is getting ready to turn black. The moon is going to turn to blood. All of these things. And there are human beings that see these things, experience these things. This may come after we go. And then those who walk through the great tribulation, remember, the earth isn't destroyed. Now, there's a lot of people that, but those who make it through the great tribulation, they will get to see Jesus come on the clouds. They'll get to see. You remember what the angel said? These angels are looking and said, This same Jesus that you see going shall so come back in what? Light manner. He gives you a picture. In other words, clouds came and received him out of their sight. The Bible says that these two witnesses, clouds came and received them back up into heaven. Well, the Bible says they're going to be looking and clouds are going to bring the very presence of God. And the Bible says, Zechariah says, he's going to stand on the Mount of Olives. There's going to be an earthquake at that time. But anyway, we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. So, you find it very clear that there is coming the kingdom of Christ on this earth. Now, you may be like, uh, like myself some years ago. I never heard this. But you know why we don't hear it very much? How many times have you heard the revelation preached or taught? But you see, here's what God is doing. And I think it's ingenious. It's wonderful. And, and it shows. God says, I want my church to be in the know. I don't want my church not to be informed. I want my church to be aware. I want them to be awakened. I want them to be alert. And you remember in Revelation uh, 16 and 17, you just look at the praise for God's sovereignty. Now, when you look in these two verses real quickly... You have praise that comes from the 24 elders. They're praising God. He is, they're praising God for His almighty power. Because here's what happens. There's only one who was and is. What's the last part? Is to come. He even announces prophecy in that. In other words, Revelation 1.8. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is and was and which is to come, the Almighty. In other words, there's nothing that's going to change God's plan. God has given us the last book in the Bible, and He said, I, I want you to understand, my, my saints, my children, my believers, I want you to understand as wicked as the world is, there is going to be a time when Christ is going to come and He's going to take them out of Satan's hand. And remember, Satan's not going to give up without a fight. I'm sure he'll do everything he can. He'll seek all of his demons. He is so perverted and he is so warped and so wicked. Satan is going to think he can be Almighty God. That's how perverted he is. And God is going to destroy him and then the earth is going to be exactly as God purposed it to be. Can't you just imagine? We're going to look at the millennia whenever we get to, into that part. Can you imagine what it's going to be like with this world being as God wanted it to be? You know, one thing that dawned on me some years ago... Adam and Eve are the only one that seen a perfect earth, aren't they? Wouldn't you like to know what they saw? Wouldn't you like to see what they saw? Wouldn't you like to experience? Because whenever they sinned, curse came on everything. Every, the world is beautiful. Folks, it is nothing compared to what it's going to be when the Lord rules in Zion. 
There's so many other passages of Scripture I could give you, but we're going to stop right there. But, but the Lord's reminding us that it's going to come. And the phrasing is, it has already happened. In the agenda of God, it's already taken place. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for just your truth, your love, your mercy. And Lord, this one compelling book, this wonderful book of the Revelation, thank you, dear Lord, for speaking to us through it. Thank you, dear Lord, for your word, for what it says. And so, Father, we just pray that, Lord, we would absorb your truth, learn your truth, grow in your truth. And, Lord, just bask in the reality that this world, the kingdoms of the world, are going to become the kingdom of our God. There is going to come a time when we will be able to literally say, the Lord rules in Zion. The Lord rules the earth. And Father, we thank you. They'll study war, no war, never be war anymore. For the Lord will rule. In Jesus, we humbly pray.